started. Uh, my name is Meg Mott. I teach politics at Marlboro College. I'm also the town moderator for Putney, which is um, another reason that I am very interested in good clash, because I like it when people disagree, especially if they don't do each other harm. Um, and I know there's like psychological harm or shooting each other. Sometimes when we disagree in the United States, we do shoot each other, and I'm really hoping that we can come up with better ways to resolve our differences. And um, so today, the theme is going to be guns and shooting one another, um, or not, I'm hoping. Uh, and I do have a dark sense of humor, so uh, my apologies if you find some of my comments um, offensive. But before we go to guns, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time, and I'm going to do this next week as well, on guns. So giving people a week to mull around and think about what the conversation was last week. So um, here's my little clicker. We're going to do high tech. Maybe, right? I think this is how I do it, yeah. Um, so just as a reminder, what we're engaged in here is good clash, and the very first thing you need to do is remove your hands from your ears, and that's what we're trying to do. With each one of these, I've called them thorny issues or hot button topics, or given the Mueller report, I want to say wedge issues in which we are easily manipulated. And we are easily manipulated with wedge issues by oligarchs. That's, that's a thesis I'm going to put out today, and it's going to be important for our discussion about the Second Amendment because um, the Second Amendment is deeply tied to, besides our current controversies, reconstruction in the United States. And so an oligarch, an oligarchic rule is when a few private interests manipulate the system so that the few private interests are um, enhanced and the public interest is, dimin is diminished. And we've had oligarchs, I mean, it's, it's a, Aristotle pointed to oligarchs as a way of running the show. It's the corrupt form of the aristocracy. As opposed to a democracy, which he would have said perhaps was somewhat corrupt, the people, you never can count on the people. Um, but we're going to be talking about a republic and a republic form of government versus an oligarchy. And I wanted to introduce that term because that's personally, as a political theorist, what I see is at stake with um, interference in our democratic processes. So just, now I think I can make that claim and it's not partisan. That is straight up political theory. When a democracy falls apart, it usually falls apart because wedge issues are manipulated the masses, they can't talk to each other, and then they are ripe for an oligarch to take over. So that's, that's, you know, and they've been saying that for a long time. I quote Aristotle, a very long time. So um, I'm gonna put you all on the spot. Ooh, I was thinking about this. Um, I have two questions for you, and we're gonna play it a little bit like a game. And the first question is going to be, what are the plausible arguments that you found, or the arguments that you found plausible in the abortion debate? And if you weren't in class last week, that's okay. This is not the kind of class where I take attendance. Uh, so just what you need to do is come up with some plausible arguments on the pro side of current abortion law. In a word, pro. Yeah, Mary. So, and we can do this in either small groups or maybe we'll just throw them out right now. Throw them out right now? Okay. All life, um, oh, and so is that, is, is that pro for row? That's okay. That's fine. Mary's letting us know what comes next, which is all life is precious. And I'm going to keep track of numbers. So whatever amount we come up with on one side, we're going to have to come up with an equal amount on the other side. It's a game. So what about on the plausible arguments pro, the 
current abortion law, which is Roe. Yes, and can you remind us your name? My name is Kimbria. This is the first time I've been here. Kimbria, thank you. Um, all women's lives are precious. Okay. Oops, sorry, lives are precious. Uh, Philip. Uh, I'm really pro-Roe, but I heard this last time and it really kind of blew my mind, uh, uh -huh. kind of against Roe, uh -huh. that a few men <coughs> can take a specific incident and turn it into a broad case to change the whole country. Ah, so and what that it... That guy who you mentioned who was, he, he was against the, the Roe versus Wade, uh -huh. he supported abortion rights but because of the way, the way it was done, a few people could change so much. As Okay, and, and my guess is, was that somebody like Cass Sunstein, uh, the law professor, or somebody who said Roe itself was badly argued because it wasn't democratic? No, it was the first one. It was the other guy. It, it was, was the other guy. Cranstein, Cranstein, said Cass that. Sunstein? Yes. Somebody, it's a lawyer who, who said that it's because it is applied so widely, mm -hmm. that's why he's opposed to it. Uh, okay, so, um, so that Roe was... Um, too, too widely. Mm -hmm. wide. Too wide. And sometimes that turns into judicial overreach. The, 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 the law happened. And so a term we might use for that is it was anti-democratic. It didn't go through the normal political process, uh, right, state by state. Elections, popular vote. Wow, was, I'm interested. We're getting more on this side. How about, you want to make sure it's balanced. And uh, you had your hand up. Could you remind me your name? Uh, how do you define life? Mm -hmm. mm. So a, pl a plausible argument for, for Roe is that Roe actually gives us a definition of life. Yeah. I mean, that's what that decision did. And so, so here we go. I'm going to write down Roe defines um, legal life. And then... Another side could be, but who, who you know, can we even define life? So, so, um... That sign you have, with the one had the sign, mm -hmm. killing babies. Right. So, um, do you want me to put it on the other side, or you didn't find it plausible? No, I didn't find it. Okay, I'm not going to put it on the other side, so but that's emotional. good. It was so emotional. It was so emotional. And what, did you say Elaine? Jean. Okay. Yeah, Jean. Uh, Pierre, who had your hand? Well, um, I, think that, I think this is pro row but just that um, outlawing abortion, the question of whether outlawing abortion uh, does anything for the common good of the nation. Yes. You know, and, and that's something we could also say around certain drugs that uh, maybe I shouldn't, I, I don't want to push this too much, but outlawing abortion. The problem is common good, question mark. And we had many conversations last time about difficulty of enforcement. Again, this is how political theorists think. We may pass a law, but there was so much discussions last week about how people were able to subvert the law earlier. And so was Roe an effort for the state to reassert um, its authority by actually making a law that it seemed like more people might follow. So no, I know it's another way to think about it, but we should always be thinking laws happen because states are trying to maintain a certain amount of legitimacy. And this one, outlawing abortion, certainly did not lead to the, lead to the common good. And I want to add, it also made it harder to enforce, which then makes the state less meaningful. Uh, yes, Julie. Oh, sorry, Nancy. Where is Julie? Oh, there, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, it also uh, stimulated people to kill people. Uh, so, arguments in favor of the abortion, it's because, because the bad abortionists? No, not bad abortionists, but people who took the law into their own hands against... Protesters. Pro thank you. Mm. Protesters. Against Roe. Yeah, so this is a really interesting piece, Nancy, that you're getting at, is that when you have a law that a few people may feel are so wrong, 
Um, are you saying that we need the law because otherwise the protesters will just be terrorizing the population? I don't know, I'm sort of putting words in your mouth. I thought you were saying the other. No, she's saying the officer. Here's some permission. Oh. So is this an argument against Roe? I know I put you in a terrible spot, Nancy. Because it's like, how does this play, right? And a lot of people are thinking about this with you right now. I can see it. Well, somebody else got some input here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like, what, is, what are we getting at in terms of a law gets passed and then there's violence on the streets? Because we talked about what John Salvi did. It was a law. Yeah, Steve, do you want to jump in? Okay. Ruth Ginsburg's point of view about that is is the opposite. Is that is that passing Roe inspired people to be violent against the decision? That's what she said. So that's what you're saying. Okay. So is that against is that against Roe or is that for Roe? Or is this just a consequence of Roe? A third, we need a third one. Maybe I should write it over here. Because it, it's, not, it's not clearly, right, it's not, but it is an effect. So we, we do want a third, and I'm going to make the third thing here, and then I'm going to turn to Shoshana. The third is the effect of Roe, and that is violent protests. Yes, thank you. Thanks for working on that one with us. Uh, Shoshana and then Julie. Well, I'm just thinking if we're talking about uh, uh, illegal deaths from uh, mm -hmm. from either for or against, yes, uh, if if Roe is in force, people who hate <coughs> that law, you know, might kill mm -hmm. people who participate mm -hmm. and, have done so. So. Yeah. and have done so. However, mm -hmm. if you don't have Roe, we know. Forever, abortion goes on, mm -hmm. and many women die because mm -hmm. they don't have the medical, you know, they're yes. not done under proper medical yeah. conditions. Yeah. And that was really one, a, yeah. a lot of women's yeah. arguments about why abortion should be legalized. Exactly. Is it okay if I write that Shoshana as regulates abortion? And by regulating it, it's like, I mean, that's the, the effort of you decriminal, you regulate drugs, and you are able to regulate drugs. So if we, if we have a law, then we can regulate safe abortions. Right. Um, who was that? Uh, Julie was after. Yeah. This would be under the effects of money. Uh -huh. uh, that it, it, gives, it gives people the freedom to use abortion as a kind of <coughs> contraception. Uh -huh, or, yeah. Or instead of contraception, which I see as a Negative. Yeah. So maybe that's also a, that's a, a con. A con. Yeah. That's a con, yeah. Okay, let's put it on as a con. It's an effect that we now see as a con. Um, there was another hand up. I, I want to make sure I catch this side. Okay, over here. Um, Janice. <coughs> Uh, well, it confirms that women's right to control her body. Uh, yes. Oh. I'm Ellen. Ellen. Uh, another basic pro argument to me is that conception is. Uh, an act equally participated in by men and women, but the consequences fall entirely on the woman, so it's an equal justice uh, argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Equalizes. Sort of, sort of equalizes the consequences a little bit, <laughs> quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and, and you're saying, like, particularly for women? Yeah. yeah. And the playing feels a little yeah. better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have your hand yes, up. I wanted to ask or note the effects of Roe. Isn't it possible because of Roe we have more education on the issues now? Mm. Oh, is that that's a, I would put that on that's a 
Yes, I think, and, and, and we have more education, and then the question will be, do we ha how is our civic education? Yeah, more education uh, because of Roe. Right. We didn't talk about this before. Ah, and so some of that is education, which is public health. And maybe some of it is constitutional. I don't know. People know more about the Ninth Amendment. I don't know. You, you all do. How about, OK, before, I'm going to take one more, and then I've got to add up things and see if which side is losing. Yeah. Pull, oh, you want it under effect. Look, Nancy, you see what you started, the whole effect thing? Political realignment. And what does that mean, Philip? One vote issues that will totally realign the whole politics. But one vote will sway people to all of this party where they might necessarily might not vote that way. Political realignment. And, and I, I'm assuming, are you talking about SCOTUS? Supreme Court of the United States? Well, I'm talking about how it affects the voters in yes. the election. Yes, yes. abortion issue. Ah, uh, OK. Got it. I'm going to just keep it with political realignment. Yes. And, and that's what wedge issues do. They move us around like billiard balls. Um, so we have, we're just going to do a little. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what do we have on this side? One, two, three. Uh oh, we need four more. You don't have to believe in it. You do not. You could. Okay. Well, I don't know. Did Jesus talk about abortion? But the gods. Okay. Okay. All right, people. People. Is that a plausible argument for this crowd? Okay. Is it a plausible argument for this crowd? No. No, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to put this down. Philip is trying to put something over on me. Okay, we got, I got one hand in the back. I, is that Howard? Howard, in the, in the shadows, yes. Is this going to be a plausible argument for this crowd? That Jesus loves children? Yeah. Okay, give me another, Howard. What? Attack on values. Ah, okay. Um, and that's a way of um, getting at this so that what specific values could you see the Roe decision being an attack on? I'm, I'm going to give it to Howard. Value of a new person. Value of a new person. Of new person. Thank you. And Steve, you've got your hand up. Well, it was essentially the same thing as to say that all life is precious. It's not just a... Uh, moral question. It's also a legal question. Uh -huh. And that that if if the Constitution of the United States um, protects um, persons. When, well it, it's a question of persons and a question of who, who counts as a person, but it's also a question of whether um, whether if you start uh, picking away at uh, the question at, at rights, mm -hmm. that, right, that you're taking, it's not just a matter of life, but you're taking rights away mm -hmm. from, a, from a being that you, that you might call a person. Yeah, okay. So is that life limited to human life? Well, what about the rights of, and I'm going to say persons, um, and then figuring out what, what, is, what is encompassed in that. Because we have a tragic history in this country where African Americans were not persons. So we have this shadow over of us of calling some beings persons and others not. And the 14th Amendment takes care of that to some degree, but it does say persons born. So, the, you know, and, and maybe then, the, well, what counts as born? Is it viability or like what is? So it opens up these legal questions. Yes, do we have something else for, for potential life? Exactly. What about the rights of persons, of potential persons? Yes, thank you. Um, I think I still need one over here. One, two, three, four, we're up to five. I don't know, I need two over here. In the back and then to Judy. Yes. And limits freedom. The, the, uh, the abortion decision, Roe, limits freedom. 
is what you're saying. No, she no, said it's no, on the other that side. It would be on the other side. Yeah, unfortunately, can you remind me your name? Carol. Carol, um, this side is seven. <laughs> We're not looking for any more on this side. I know there's that ur urgency, like just get it in, but we're trying to see if we can do good clash and actually have on both sides. So I, I had another hand up, but it was Judy. Um, I want to get at the uh, interest of the government in regulating it at all. Ah, do you want to say more, Judy? I don't think so. <laughs> well, I, because this is... In order for the government or the state to make a law at all, it has to demonstrate that it has a rational a, basis. A rational basis in it, and so uh, the argument against Roe would be that if there's no rational basis for the state to regulate uh, abortion at all. It's, it's such a personal matter. Well, Judy, if I could just push on that just a little bit more, because what it said is the states didn't have rational basis because there were greater freedoms at stake, the Ninth Amendment, liberty. And so the Constitution trumped state law. That's how they read it. Well, uh, state, I mean government. In general. So uh, an argument against it, which is exactly at this, is kind of don't states have the right to regulate? And I know that may be hard, but I, don't, don't the states have this right? to regulate this. We're supposed to have a federal system where, uh, that's an experiment. Yeah, Steve, and then um, Oliver. The strongest dissents have simply been that there's nothing in the Constitution that supports right. abortion. Right, right. That, that, it, that, the argument that, uh, that the argument that Blackman made in Roe was um, a moral argument and not a Constitution. Not a Constitution. It wasn't good law. Um, now, if I, I want to ask Oliver what he was going to say because we are now having a. I can't have this game go on forever because if we get eight over here, I have to go back over there. So, but I, I want to hold on to Steve's. But first, Oliver. I, I would go back to the argument that God uh, prohibits abortion, and that I would dare say the majority, if not everybody here, would disagree with that. But it's still a plausible argument. I can see somebody who believes in God, okay. who believes the Word of the Bible. Can find in there uh -huh. Okay, uh, and so Oliver, I'm going to give this uh, up here, this one even more strength, legal, moral, and theological, and then I'm going to get Steve's down here because it is one of the big arguments against Roe, which is no constitutional right. And that's how it was argued. Oops. So that's what that says, no constitutional right. Okay. We're going to hold on to this for the very last class because we're going to start to do more good clashes. Um, so thanks, everybody. And now we're going to switch it up to um, guns. I'll move this into the background. Because, yes, what? Are you implying that if it had been argued on the basis of privacy, that you wouldn't, it would be a completely different story? So the big piece with Roe is, should it have been a privacy argument, which was using the ninth and building on the contraception cases from Connecticut, or should they have gone, this was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, suggestion, go an equal protection route. So I think it was, oh, oh do I remember? Oh, Carol. Was it Carol? Um, I'm sorry, it was, it was Ellen. I think it was Ellen who, who was saying something about equal protection, that women's equal rights. That was going to be an argument. If you allow men to have a vasectomy, you should allow women to have an abortion. That would have been the kind of argument that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wanted. And she was very much of an equal protection thinker. Feminists at the time hated her. She was not the beloved RBG she is right now because she would help men who were... Um, getting unfavorable custody arrangements and make a case for equal protection. Men deserve to be treated as parents, the way women were getting special privileges, perhaps, you might say, in, a, uh, in divorce decisions or custody decisions. So she wanted to go a very different road. She wanted to go down the 14th Amendment and was not happy with the 9th Amendment. But we're going to now switch it up. We're still Constitution. Isn't this nice? A lot of the things that we just talked about um, will be able to keep going. 
So um, just a reminder, these are um, things that came from an earlier class. Somebody be willing to read John Stuart Mill on the left. Every opinion ought to be considered precious with whatever amount of error and confusion that truth may be blended. Yeah, OK. So we're doing this again on a very difficult issue. Um, it looked as pretty well. We were able to get seven and seven. We made an effort to let's think about the other side. We don't have to agree with the other side, but can we be able to articulate it? And somebody want to read John, oh, sorry, Jane Adams from that side. The emancipation of one faction has to be inclusive of another faction, or it will encounter many failures, cruelties, and reactions. So just two things to remember. It's very, very high standard, especially if we're feeling like this is a wedge issue and we can't see anything good in the other side. And yet this is what we're being asked to do. Not to necessarily agree, but to, if you can articulate the other side, that's amazing. And my favorite guy, because we should all remember that when we say we are reasoning, in fact, what we're doing is, and um, somebody on this, on uh, Wesley, do you want to read this? We desire nothing because we judge it to be good, but on the contrary, we call it good because we desire it. Right, right. And, w and that exercise that we just went through, that, you know, I'm actually super impressed that we came up with seven plausible arguments for both sides. That's quite impressive. Um, and just to restate Spinoza, in other words, first we make up our minds, and then we look for arguments to support our conclusions. Oliver Wendell Holmes was willing to say that about the Supreme Court and the justices. He said, that's, that's how we roll. Most of the justices said, no, 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 no. No, we pick up our constitution. We look at it from our noble, educated, robed uh, perspective, and we are able to tell you the truth. But in fact, says Holmes, this is the beginning of legal pragmatism, um, this is how we operate, all of us, even if we are wearing robes. So um, just another reminder, this was important, and I did bring a, um, a few handouts. Um, I, I have about 10 copies. Uh, I think, Elizabeth, you had asked for something around um, uh, what are their guidelines. You can also find it online, Talking with the Enemy. So they recommend, these are pretty basic rules. Deliberators ask this as well. Communicate openly with opponents, away from the polarizing spotlight of media coverage. So necessary. Build relationships of mutual respect and understanding. And I don't want to overplay this. It doesn't mean that you all become dear friends. For me, you have mutual understanding. Sometimes I get into an argument with somebody and I say, you know, I don't like that argument. I don't find that very persuasive. I think this argument is one you should use. And all of a sudden it changed the entire dynamics. Because I've spent enough time understanding the op opposition's arguments that I can actually engage. And I want a worthy opponent. So if I so think somebody is making a really terrible argument, I say, that's not going to fly with me. And it's certainly not going to fly in Wyndham County. Or if you're trying to go national, I'm not sure it's going to fly in Missouri. But if you tried this one, you might have a better chance. That's a very different way to engage in clash. And that's part of what we're doing here is to build those skills. Uh, and if you turn it into a more of a game, sometimes it feels like there's less at stake. You can de-escalate the rhetoric. And the abortion um, group that got together, the, and I shouldn't call them the abortion group, they're the public conversations project that included people who were pro-life and people who were pro-choice. Um, they were very clear what they wanted. They wanted to reduce future shootings. And I do think it pertains to our conversation about guns. That what we're talking about is regulation and what's at stake is shooting. Yes, Janice. I listened to an um, interview with four of them the other day from Channel 5 or something. And <clears throat> both sides said that 
the biggest benefit was the fact that when they then went out now and spoke about their issue, they had de-escalated the rhetoric. Wow. They were speaking from a completely different wow. um, position. Wow, did everybody hear Janice that these, that there was something that Janice found through Channel 5 that talked to the six women who were part of this and that when they went out and talked about this issue, they were able to de-escalate the, the rhetoric. So isn't that an amazing piece of when you engage in this kind of work, you will naturally change the way you talk about it. You will be more careful with your words and you will be able to say, my worthy opponent makes this claim which is completely different. I know debate has run out of favor in the uh, public school system. They're much more for um, understanding without debate, is my humble opinion. Uh, but I do think good clash really means understanding the arguments, plausible arguments on both sides, mm -hmm. and that we don't get that confused with finding common ground. Um, so now, ready to change to Topic at hand, and yes, I know, I'm like a constitutional junkie. I know I keep picking it up, because this to me is the roadmap for the whole thing, um, and the Second Amendment is such an interesting amendment, and we're going to be able to understand why there might be reasonable disagreement about it. It has a lot to do with its grammar, I think. So would somebody like to read the Second Amendment? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So it's a wild sentence in that it's not subject, verb, object. There's a prefatory clause. There's what some people call an operating or operative clause. Um, and how, where you put your emphasis, emphasis, has a lot to do with your interpretation. Because this is, this is squiggly. Uh, it's one of the more squiggly sentences in the Constitution, I think. Um, so which clause means the most to you? We've got some choices. Uh, yeah, Wesley. What do you call a clause? What a, go back to the first, the next page back and show me the two clauses. That I'm, I'm going to point out actually three. Okay. And I know there's one comma. And then there's a second comma. So the one way of breaking them up, do you see the two commas? One is a well-regulated militia, comma. And then there's also, oh, sorry, there's three commas. Thank you. And then the third is, uh, after arms shall not be infringed. Yeah, Susan, were you going to add to the commas? Or? That was all. I know yeah. that there were. There's three, sorry about that. That last comma shouldn't even be in there. Yes, you see, Shoshana's making her first, I mean, I was waiting for my grammarians. Come on out, this is your time, right? How many commas? Should there even be that comma? What's going on? Um, so, you know, just from a purely grammatical viewpoint, it matters. Because, okay, so thank you. So Wesley, I know I'm not fully answering your question, but I think the next slide will. So, but do we understand, though, that it's a sentence that's broken up? Yeah, somebody wants to jump. Is that Scott? No. No. Bob. Bob. Bob just a, a question. Mm. What, what year did the Second Amendment come out with? I think it came out with the whole 10. And so I think that is, I have to put on my glasses. So if it was signed, I think the Constitution was signed, was it 1780? 87? September 17th, oh, sorry, everybody. OK, um, so the Constitution was signed on the 17th day of September in, in 1787. And then the Bill of Rights was ratified December 15th, 1791. Yeah, so a little bit later, Bill of Rights comes in. Um, OK, so. In fact, the Constitution couldn't be ratified without that. The, the Constitution... The whole Ten Amendments, right? Many of the states objected to Well, it. they passed it in 1787 without the Bill of Rights. So it was, you know, I mean, it was incomplete. And then they, there was a lot of pushback. So then they ratified this. Um, yeah, the whole thing was contested, and they had no legal authority to write it, but who cares? So, um, 
So here's some ways you can break it down. And I'm breaking it down the way the um, controversy gets framed. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, that's, if you put a lot of attention on that clause, you will have one kind of interpretation. And we're going to actually go through all this. But I want you to see what's at stake. The right of the people. This one doesn't get enough attention in current political discourse, but I'm hoping we can make number three interpretation count. Just because if you have more interpretations, you're going to have better clash. If it's a binary, you can count on it being very, very oppositional. And then the third, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's the entire thing. Depending on which clause you count, you're going to come up with a different way to read it. So let's, oh yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, I don't see it divided that way. The right of the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Mm -hmm. Right. And and can you tell me your name, Patsy? So Patsy is saying, wait a minute. I don't see. Why did you split it up that way? And that is a perfectly reasonable question. It's only because I'm going to bring the third way of reading it in, and so I broke it up that way. Oftentimes, the way the controversy is framed is either you believe in the first one, or you combine the second two, and that's your side. But I'm going to try and mix this up a little bit. So yeah, Julie. Can we define militia first? <laughs> ah, OK. Uh, militia. I'm going to, I'm not going to answer Julie's question, which is, what is a militia? I'm going to move a little bit further along, and we will see how it gets defined. Because these terms, this is the lovely thing about doing law. This is why it's such a fun game. You need to make a plausible argument for your definition. Because militia is only one part of the people. Because Julie is saying militia is only one part of the, of the people. So this would be a place to start. If we wanted to, to push back on certain interpretations, this is exactly the kind of logic we could be using. Yes, yeah. And uh, Judy, you had your hand up, and then Marion. Well, I just flashed on my that you could read it, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security so. of the free state shall not be infringed. Right. And that sort of raises the question about who is going to do it? Exactly. So did you, did you hear how Judy then, she read it by starting at the beginning, the prefatory clause, and going right to the conclusion. And that's a nice sentence because it's very clear where you're trying to do, where you're trying to go. Um, there was another hand up. Marion, yeah. Uh, kind of along the same lines, I was thinking of just taking a well-regulated militia shall not be infringed uh -huh. as one statement and then Another statement would be the right of the people. Sure. Right. So Marion is, is also, in the same idea, grab the beginning, go to the end, and make your point. And Steve, and then I'm going to move slides. You probably want to get to this later, but the, the right of the people phrase reminds me of what the argument you made last time about the Ninth Amendment. And that <laughs> Oh, oops, sorry. I just, I, I guess I can't dance. That is so on it. OK, so um, all right. So I'm going to tell you what Steve just said. But I have to, do I need help? I may need help. I got too excited. Yippee! All right. So Steve said, this, the right of the people, reminds me of the argument that was made last time by Akil Reed Amar that says, when we're talking about the Bill of Rights, we are not talking about private rights. We are talking about collective rights. So yes, that is exactly why I separated out this part of the amendment, because this opens up a whole new way of looking at this problem, which, in my humble opinion, may get us out of the terrible clash we're in to having a third way to go, which can sometimes. So without any further ado, here we're going to look at uh, the state's rights interpretation. So um, those of you who were saying, I would go, like Marion said this, I would go right with the very beginning, and then I'd go to the end. That's the state's rights interpretation. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. What's a militia? States organize armed forces. What does that look like? 
National Guard, absolutely. So that has been a way to interpret the Second Amendment, that it is a state's right and it has to do with the National Guard. Um, anybody here in the National Guard or involved with the National Guard? Anyway, uh, so that's an understanding where the Second Amendment makes it possible for the states to create such a body. Um, individual rights interpretation, and this is one that has become increasingly um, vocal. I, I should tell you, though, when I was in grad school studying public law, the Second Amendment was a non-entity. It has recently become a big entity, and it was during Reconstruction. But for the longest time, nobody was writing their dissertation on the Second Amendment. It just was nothing. And this was in the mid to late 90s. So in this interpretation, the focus is on the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And the interpretation is individuals may organize themselves into militias. Yes? Well, if you have a strict constitution saying that you can only do what the constitution says, then arms meant muskets and, you know. So Lynn is asking, uh, if you're a strict constitutionalist and you're wanting to interpret it in a way that actually goes back to something like original intent, uh, wouldn't that limit arms to muskets and not AR, what are they, AR-15s, AK-47s? Um, you could make that case. And, and Lynn would like to make that case, and then we also run into problem of then if we are trying to do something else that is nothing to do with the founding, can we use the Constitution for guidelines? So it is, it is a way to make an argument, and then it's the question is um, how to persuade. And, and I'm going to be showing you one picture of what it looks like. Um, so that is a militia from the, I, somewhere in the southwest. I was trying to figure out exactly what the group was. But it's, it's in, I'm sorry. Uh, this group is not a Native American group. I, that may be, a, I, I, my guess is it has to do with grazing on federal land. So that's my, my guess. Um, but it is, you can see, unlike the um, National Guard, you, clear differences. First of all, their outfits are not so uniform. Um, and it is individuals being able to arm themselves in order to form a group. So that's an individualist interpretation. And um, that was also how the Black Panthers were able to organize themselves. So how was it possible for the Black Panthers? And I know uh, when I was a child in New Haven, the most exciting moment in my career was when the Black Panthers came to New Haven for the Bobby Seale trial. And boy, did I get to see a lot of people all of a sudden act much more cautiously. My dad, in particular, he was careful around these beautifully, uh, you know, the berets, the, the jackets were very, very nice. The hippies did not look so good, but they were very well armed. And that all of a sudden got them lots of respect. So that is an individual interpretation of the Second Amendment not through the states, but through individuals needing to arm themselves in order to take care of things. Um, now our third, this is what Steve saw coming down the pike. I just love it. If I can come up with a whole new way to read it, just because it's like sorbet in between the meals, right? <laughs> First we hear one side, states' rights. Then we have a little Republican interpretation. And then we get an individual. Hmm, now what do we think? So Akhil Reed Amar, a law professor at Yale, he says the right of the people to, uh, that clause means the subject of this right is we the people, not the states nor individuals. He does this reliably. And he's got a great book called The Bill of Rights, um, and which came out, I think, 2006. He takes a uh, Republican view. And when I mean Republican, I don't mean the party. I mean a form of government which is different than an oligarch. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, Article 4, Section 4 guarantees each state a Republican form of government. It's one of those underutilized 
uh, parts of the Constitution, which may become more and more important as things start to go to the states again, if that's what happens, uh, to have an understanding that a state has to be, have a Republican form of government. Founding history confirms a Republican reading of the Second Amendment. Yes, Shana. I just don't understand what we the people means mm. if it's not either states or individuals. Yeah, so what is this entity, we the people? The yeah. What did you say? The common good. The common good. The we the people is the subject of the common good. Yeah, Steve. But, but wasn't the... American Revolution originally groups of people. There were no states at the time, right. but there would have been no American Revolution if small groups of people hadn't gathered together. It's a little bit like the individual militias, mm -hmm. but groups of people saying we have the right to protect ourselves. Right, so, so self-defense on this popular level, uh, um, the Declaration of Independence is framed as we the people, They'd read Rousseau. It's a crazy idea. It's called general will. It's not an individual will. It's not a corporate will or a government will. It is a general will. It's almost like Marx's species being. It's that all of us come together and we have something that we all want and that's what we will. So it's problematic because I think as maybe Doug mentioned last time, um, it's very impractical. Because what's to say it's the general will and not a faction? If you win, Mary and then Shoshana. Wouldn't it be a majority? Or in some cases, two-thirds. But depending on what the law says, is the number of people needed to pass a law. Yeah, so Mary is saying, from a practical standpoint, in order for the law to pass, you need a majority. Or you need two-thirds if it requires a supermajority. So that, that would be one way we could understand it. This is how we understand the United States. It's that way. And um, as I said, the Constitutional Convention had no legal authority. They were not told to go off and do that. They did it. And what did they invoke? We the people. So is it something that actually exists? Sure. Where? In the imaginations of the people who won. And I don't mean that in a totally cynical way. But it is what drives this whole game that we're playing. I don't mean that also in a trivial way. Our Constitution is crafted by this concept, we the people. And it's a, a reflection of the history of that time, the philosophy at that time, so, that phrase. So Myra's saying it's a reflection of the history of that time. Yes, these people, this is why I love them. They were reading political theory. They were reading people like Rousseau. They had this idea. They were reading people like Machiavelli. Um, but maybe we still want it because what does it mean? A Republican form of government requires consent of the governed, as opposed to an oligarchy, which does not require consent of the governed. Uh, it also abides by rule of law. I know I'm obnoxious with my constitutional references, but that's why I do that, because this is the form of government we have. So it's got to be by rule of law and protects collective liberties, the Bill of Rights. So that's another way of understanding the Second Amendment is that it is the rights of the people. When they do not like what is happening, either in their state or in the national government, and they believe that we have lost the general will, the social contract has been taken out because an oligarchical group has taken over, we have the right to get our weapons and go and work together. So it's really key, and this is big for why the United States has a Second Amendment. Um, we may think it's, as Lynn was saying, seems like it made sense back in the 18th century, but do we really need it now? Um, it's gonna be hard to unbake it because it's really big. So I'm gonna push us with um, a few more pieces of, um, how uh, arms work in a republic. Somebody want to read this quote, and then you can guess who it is. By arming your subjects, you arm yourself. Those who were suspect become loyal, and those who were loyal are changed from being your subjects to being your partisans. Yeah, and Mary, could you read this one too? As soon as you disarm your subjects, you start to offend them. 
showing whether through cowardice or suspicion that you mistrust them. On either score, hatred is aroused against you. Yeah. So if you want to trust people, let them be armed. Show them that they're truly citizens, not subjects. If you want to get them upset, take away their arms, because then they will hate you, because they will see you're afraid. Who do you think said that? Who? Machiavelli. Oh, look at that. So right. Yes. Yes, he did. Um, and uh, so, so this very idea comes into the United States project through James Madison. No. Oh, sorry. Janice. Yes, just because Machiavelli said it doesn't mean it's correct. There are lots oh. of societies like that <laughs> <laughs> have existed taking arms away from their people um, who have not suffered that. So Janice wants us to think that Machiavelli is not a demigod. OK, I'm willing to hear that. Just because it said it doesn't mean it's really true. Um, he's, uh, he's observing something. And uh, we could probably find some evidence of countries that willingly disarm themselves. And, and I'm completely willing to hear that. And, um, but I'm, I'm wanting us to understand why the Second Amendment has the prominence it does in the United States. In the United States, yes. What is it of the individualistic psyche of the United States that makes this right. operative? Yeah, so, so again, with Spinoza, you desire something. You, it's not because the reasoning is good. It's because you desire it. And um, this idea became very important to the Federalists, Federalist 46, and which James Madison said, European governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. If European citizens were armed, it may be affirmed with the greatest assurance that the throne of every tyranny in Europe would be speedily overturned. So this is an argument at the time that said, why are we doing this in the United States? Why do we have a Second Amendment? It's because otherwise we're going to end up being an oligarchy. And this is what's going to keep us from being an oligarchy. Now, Europe didn't have that same political beginnings. So this, the, the people didn't have guns. Again, you could say, you know, this may have been appropriate back then, but this is getting to be a problem now. And that's a perfectly reasonable argument. But I'm wanting us to understand what the background of the Second Amendment is. Because it's a big deal trying to get rid of the amendment. Um, so as I said, the Second Amendment was absolutely nothing for the longest time. It had no relevance in political discourse. And then we hit Reconstruction. Another slightly illegal thing, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, wasn't a majority vote. Um, it was a legal maneuver that because the southern states had ceded, succeeded, they were um, no longer able to participate. It was a bold effort. And at that point, the states were run by local officials because Lincoln did not completely strip the states of all their uh, legal status. So you had southern states with free black men who had a Second Amendment protections. And the Colfax massacre uh, was 1873. It's very hard to see this. I'm sorry. Maybe, or maybe you all can see a little better than I can. I think 150 black men and women, perhaps, were killed, 150 black persons, and three white people were killed. Basically, there was a protest at, the, um, at a municipal building as black free men were trying to register to vote. And white supremacists come in fully armed, and <clears throat> that's the Colfax uh, massacre. The, because it was Louisiana, there were no criminal charges brought against the white assailants. However, they did bring charges of uh, violation of the Second Amendment. Here were these black people at the uh, municipal building. They were protesting. They were armed. Why shouldn't they be armed? It was a rough situation. And, and they, so they filed a federal lawsuit saying that their Second Amendment, sorry, their First Amendment right to assemble, their Second Amendment right to carry arms had been violated. And that went to the Supreme Court. Um, so 
I don't know the actual parties. Well, actually, I can tell you. Uh, United States v. Cruikshank. So the United States government filed this case. Cruikshank being the representative of the black people or the uh, supremacists? Cruikshank, um, and these are great questions. I'm sorry I don't have all these answers. I believe Cruikshank was a Louisiana official. So it's the federal government bringing federal charges of constitutional violations against the state. Cruikshank? I'm going to guess white. But again. Well, you did say that there were three black people there. The, well, they were trying to register to vote. There, there was a whole group who was trying to register to vote. And, and so then the, the, and they were armed. And there were white assailants who came in. And they were heavily armed because the, yeah, 150 black people died, three white people died. Um, so this is a Second Amendment case that goes to the Supreme Court. One of the few. And the court decided the Second Amendment has no other effect than to restrict the powers of the national government. The fact that the state was involved is, um, is, does not matter, because the Bill of Rights constrains the national government. It does not constrain the states. It was only later, after the 14th Amendment, they started to apply uh, the Bill of Rights to the states through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. But prior to the 14th Amendment, there was no understanding that the Bill of Rights applied to anybody except national actors. So that's, um, that becomes the law of the land with respect to the Second Amendment. Just to reiterate it, no Second Amendment protections against state action. And the convictions of the white men, and this is their federal convictions for violations of liberties were overturned. However, uh, I don't believe criminal charges were ever filed. And are we surprised? That's what it was like in the South before and after the Civil War. So here's a, a picture that I found um, online from Harper's, so this is an 1875 decision, two years later. There's a picture of somebody voting. They have a little thing that says peace. Uh, they're voting for the Democrats. The Democrats were the white Southern majority, the oligarchs, Democratic Party, as opposed to the Republicans who were a party of liberties and reconstruction. And the poster says the Republican Party is dead. And here is somebody greatly humbled, not armed, Greatly humbled voting for a Democrat. Because what else can you do? Yes, yeah, Susan. Uh, just a bit of information. Cruikshank was one of the mob. Cruikshank was one of the mob. Thank you. Appreciate that. Was he white? Yeah, one of the white assailants? Yeah. That makes total sense. Thank you. Um, so, uh, there was then a shift, though. It took a long time. This was basically the law of the land. The Second Amendment does not apply to the states. The Second Amendment just applies to the federal government. And therefore, cities and states should be able to do what they want. I want to keep track of the time a little bit here. Um, it is 11. Um, normally, we would take a break. So maybe this is a good place, since I'm about to go into the current era discussion on the Second Amendment and guns. So let's take a. Seven minute break? People are getting back into their seats. I wanted to go back to this for one little piece because there was a, two comments, questions over the break about this. Um, I, I think I used the term white supremacist came in and somebody asked, um, is that actually the term that would have been used at the time? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I feel like I have been finding some of that language earlier than this century. Um, but I, I don't know that for a fact. I'm going to go and look at some resources, or we'll put our librarians on this to see when does this term start to be used. Which but term? white supremacists. Um, however, um, one of the tragedies about this particular piece is you would wonder why didn't anybody do something about this? Because at that point, we have. <laughs> Uh, the Republic, oh, actually, 1873, I'm always wondering, who was in charge at that time? Was it Johnson? 
Ah, or when is Lincoln assassinated? No, Lincoln was long gone, but it was either Johnson or Grant. Was it Johnson or Grant? I almost feel like it was Grant. Grant, okay, I love it. All right, so here we are. Grant's in charge. You would think perhaps there would be an, a willingness to do something about this. In fact, people are tired of shooting each other. So this goes, just goes by. Grant knows about this. Are they going to start up again? No. There's something about, and, and um, oftentimes war is going to be, reach a certain point. Population is not going to go, want to go to war anymore. Uh, that's the way it's, maybe nature has it designed. These wars we have right now where there's not enough blood. I know that sounds terrible from the people who are actually fighting. It's harder to stop them. So um, I, this is something that um, could not be stopped. And, and so the Second Amendment rights and also their freedom to assembly rights were not pursued militarily. The other piece I wanted to mention about this um, is that, um, oh yeah, no, I guess they, I said them both. Oh, what they might have said instead of white supremacists were oligarchs. That was a term that people who were wanting to build reconstruction and make it robust use quite regularly. That the problem with the southern states was that they didn't use a Republican form of government and that they were too oligarchical. So that just private interests were in charge. That might have been more of a term used against uh, a group of white people who are wanting to take over than white supremacists at that time. And this is kind of why I wanted to talk about oligarchy in the beginning of a discussion on guns. But let's go up to restrictions on arms. So at this point, the Second Amendment just pertains to national actors, not state actors. And so in the 1980s, cities with high crime rates use handgun bans and mandatory minimums to reduce guns in the streets. Uh, this happened a lot. This is pretty fascinating, especially I use that term white supremacy. That term can, I think, be overused because then we lose some interesting analysis. If everything is understood as white people are just trying to take out black people. We miss more interesting details. So um, in DC, which was, they called it at the time, a chocolate city, majority minority, uh, Eric Holder promoted Operation Cease Fire, which used pretext traffic stops to arrest people with guns in their cars. Many people would say that was a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. However, um, the situation was so bad that here's Eric Holder. Uh, he pushed, and so did many black leaders, for the war on drugs to amp up so that um, race traders now, I'm not saying Eric Holder used that term, Jesse Jackson used that term, but people who were engaged in drug trafficking, guns, drug use, were going to be put away and pushing for very stiff penalties. Uh, James Foreman just wrote a book on this called Locking Up Our Own. It got a Pulitzer last year. Yes, Marion. I believe back in the 1970s, uh, or maybe 80s, there was a law in Massachusetts that you should not have a weapon in your car or you would be, have a mandatory jail sentence. So Marion has just said in Massachusetts there would be a law starting in the 70s. This is about when all these things started to happen. Uh, I would, I'm going to guess it was in Boston, where, and, and maybe then they put it on a state -like level. Peter, do you know something about this? I had a close call. I was driving a friend's <laughs> car, and I got pulled over for speeding. And there were guns in the back of the car, but fortunately, I didn't know they were there. And fortunately, the policeman didn't uh, check. Check. Didn't check. Or else I would have been put in prison. Right. So Peter, did everybody hear Peter's talking about getting pulled over in Massachusetts? He didn't even know the guns were there, and he would have been put in prison. Because this was mandatory sentencing. You have a gun, you are going to jail. Kimbria, is that? Yes, thank you. Huh? Um, so one of the pieces I see tying through from Reconstruction to now is you don't necessarily have to be a white supremacist. You can also just have white privilege. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if you were an African American, there's a good chance they would have checked the whole car right. rather than giving you the benefit of the doubt. And it could have been the same with Reconstruction. There may not have been people who um, who felt, you know, were outright racist, 
But they also said, well, maybe I don't want African Americans or slaves, freed slaves to, to uh, compete with me for jobs or oh. women or whatever. And it wasn't really all out wanting them to be harmed, but right. still, I don't want to lose what I have. Yeah, so did people hear Kimberia about that this is, this is an example of, of looking at how white privilege plays out, where one group gets treated one way and another group gets treated another way. So um, assuming, uh, you know, making the assumption that perhaps like Peter was not going to be the type of person who got put in jail. Uh, that this is why I highly recommend you also read James Foreman's book, because this is um, cities that, where it's neighborhoods. If you are in a certain neighborhood and you have a gun in your car, you are going to jail. But if you are a black middle class person, you are not necessarily going to get you. Because these are pretext stops. These are looking for certain kinds of cars to pull over. And yeah, and, and I think race is always very helpful. But I'm also aware of sometimes I think it just, we miss some stories where uh, this can be get very specific to neighborhoods. Lynn. This is a personal story, I think. Um, my daughter was uh, renting a car, and it was a very high, very expensive. And I'm saying, what do you need a car like that? And she said, Mom, if I'm riding around in Vermont and Massachusetts, and I'm in a junk car, I'm going to get pulled over because I'm black. Uh -huh. So Lynn just told a story about her daughter who was needing to rent a, a really nice looking car because as a, a young woman of color, or, or maybe not so young anymore, uh, 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 that she, if she doesn't have a nice looking car, she's going to get stopped. Um, and, and I ha have heard stories of even people with nice looking cars in Vermont driving while black. Um, and so then there was another piece that happened. This was in the 90s. The Violence Against Women Act was passed, and it made it unlawful for anyone with a restraining order to carry a firearm. Um, and so I remember when I worked at the, used to be called the Women's Fru uh, Crisis Center, calling up and saying, hey, we just got a restraining order on this guy. Can't you take away his weapons? I called up ATF. ATF says, honey, you know how many agents we have in this state? Three. Most of them are in Chittenden County. You think we're going to go after every guy you get a restraining order, about, uh, a restraining order on? Think again. Uh, and this is, I mention this because whenever we're talking about the law, we should always be thinking about practical enforcement. Yes, laws get passed, and then it's like, OK. However, um, this one doctor in Texas was, uh, um, he, had, he owned a pistol. His wife got a restraining order against him. She, uh, he had threatened her with the pistol. And so she went through the necessary moves through the Violence Against Women Act to get his pistol removed. He says, that's a violation. I've got, I got a Second Amendment, and I think Texas had something in its constitution um, that protected the right to bear arms. So that case goes up the federal system, not all the way to the Supreme Court, but the Second Amendment, which had been quietly sleeping, not a big deal for many, many, many decades, um, spurs a memo from John Ashcroft. Somebody want to read this? The Second Amendment more broadly protects the rights of individuals, including persons who are not members of any militia or engaged in any active military service or training, to possess and bear their own firearms subject to reasonable restrictions designed to prevent criminal misuse. So this language protects the rights of individuals. It had never received such a big imprimatur. It doesn't go to the Supreme Court. It is not the law of the land. We are still operating under Cruikshank. There may have been one other Second Amendment case that happened. Um, but this, this new language, and I always think, November 2001, country is a little traumatized, perhaps. Uh, this, the idea of protection is feeling very big in people's consciousness. But that's just a memo. It doesn't go to the Supreme Court. Um, but this is the big case, District of Columbia v. Heller with Antonine Scalia. It is a District of Columbia case, so therefore it applies to the federal government, so the Bill of Rights pertains in DC. And he says, the right to bear arms extends beyond military service, building on what Ashcroft had said. 
Another key comment, and whenever the Supreme Court uses this language, you've got to know they're going to move to take it out of the federal government and turn it to the states. Self-defense is a fundamental right. When they start talking fundamental, that means they're going to try and incorporate it into um, states are also involved. So it, that, everybody's like, whoa. Called it a fundamental right. If the Second Amendment is a fundamental right, not the sleeping little amendment, then that means everybody's going to have to abide by it, just as privacy became a fundamental right under Roe. However, sometimes people forget this. Um, if you are in a conversation with somebody about the Heller decision, because it changed the whole landscape around gun rights in the United States. Amazing decision. He does not give unlicensed or absolute rights to individuals. He says, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on, and would somebody be willing to read this list? The, the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill. So this uh, becomes big because who gets to determine whether you are mentally ill or not? Um, that's uh, a lot of people are a little nervous about that. Like, whoa, are you going to discriminate against mentally ill people? Who's going who, to be able to make this happen? All laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in oh. sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing con conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. There are a lot of restrictions there. You cannot have guns in schools. You cannot have guns in government buildings. Um, and if uh, around the sale of arms, you can impose all sorts of regulations. So I know Heller has oftentimes been triumphed as, look, everybody can do what they want with guns. I have all these rights. In fact, that is a fairly limited. Yes, he said self-defense is a fundamental right. But there are all these restrictions on it. Um, so, uh, Stevens dissent, he says, if it was an individual right, the founders would have said so. Because there's nothing in the Second Amendment that made it sound like it was individuals, it was we the people. The militia preamble limits the guarantee to state militias anyway, like the National Guard. And, and National Guard, and I was hoping there was somebody here who may be able to answer this. Nas am, am I right, though, National Guards are ordered by governors? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I even though they're called National Guards, it's a little strange. Um, that it is a state function. Uh, so state militia service only. And the Supreme Court has never considered gun control laws unconstitutional. So that's the dissent. It's a 5-4 decision. That doesn't go anywhere. Heller is the law of the land. And not too surprisingly, we move to, oh, sorry, there's Heller being excited. And do you, do you like how, like, shall not be infringed any question? I kind of love it, like people are using the Constitution. But then that other thing, is there any question? Well, yes. There's a lot of questions about how you interpret it. But they're having their day in the sun, you know. And uh, that's Patrick Henry quotation, the great object. Thank you. Yeah. So, like, uh, I, I, you know, I'm always appreciating a good American history argument. Patrick Henry, little constitution. Um, so there's Heller's victory. It doesn't say anything about limited to this, this, and this. And also, a big piece, he said the right to self-defense was fundamental. Self-defense and the way, if you read Scalia's decision, it's in your home. It means you get, to, you get to be in your home, and if somebody comes after you, you can shoot them, as opposed to you get to wander around and harass people. So, and I feel like that's important because the language is self-defense. Or stand your ground. Well, stand your ground is a state statute. Yeah, so this is, this is the Supreme Court making its argument. Um, okay, so the next big case, McDonald v. City of Chicago, 2010. And there's our, our um, plaintiff, McDonald, who was living in Chicago for a long time. He was an engineer, Otis McDonald. Um, 
he lived in a high crime neighborhood and he had a rifle, but he couldn't have a rifle. Because Chicago, while it required all guns to be registered with the city, and his rifle was registered, for his circumstances, he wanted a handgun. Because the rifle was just not going to help him. It was too uh, dangerous where he was living. So Chicago in 1982 prohibited the registration of handguns. This is why when people say if you outlaw guns, only criminals will have guns. Yeah. Well, Otis McDonald, that's his point. I'm living in a terrible situation. He was a community activist in Chicago. He had been pushing for alternative forms of justice, and the drug dealers were seriously angry at him. So he was receiving death threats. And he just saw he did not have a chance if he was going to use his rifle, because that's like clack, 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 not to. Um, so um, McDonald is, you know, we were talking a little bit last time about Roe v. Wade and Norma McCorvey and how she's no longer um, behind the uh, Roe v. Wade decision. And uh, Steve was reminding us that um, it was because the lawyers were looking for a good plaintiff. And you can imagine, right, if you're a cause lawyer, if you're trying to change the laws, you want a very good plaintiff. And Otis McDonald is a great plaintiff. And I'm not being cynical. I would, I mean, if I was wanting to change the laws, I would love Otis McDonald to be my plaintiff because he's a community activist, he has very legitimate concerns, and it brings in the whole race piece around guns in America. Who gets to have guns and who can't have guns? Who gets heavily policed and who doesn't get heavily policed? So this was a big one. And Alito's opinion um, is, brings up the reconstruction. Before I get to the conclusion, one of the things he says, he talks about the Freedmen's Bureau Act of 1866 and that it allowed the rights of all citizens to keep and bear arms. If the cabin door of a freedman is broken open and the intruder enters for purposes as vile as were known to slavery, then should a well-loaded musket be in the hand of the occupant to send the polluted wretch to another world. And this was an argument made by Senator Pomeroy in 1836. One of the senators who were saying, you know, if you're going to have this happen, we're going to try and free um, African-American slaves, we have got to make sure these people are armed and protected by the Second Amendment, because otherwise we're setting them up. So Alito cites that in this um, McDonald opinion. Somebody want to read this? Due process clause of 14th Amendment incorporates the Second Amendment right recognized in Heller. So now it's going to pertain to cities and states. Individual self-defense is the central component of the Second Amendment. Yeah. So reinforces, once again, this is an individual right, but it's an individual right of self-defense. Um, Breyer's dissent. Somebody want to read this? The framers did not write the Second Amendment in order to protect a private right of armed self-defense. There has been and is no consensus mm -hmm. that the right is or was fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, we're talking about basic right, and as with Roe and privacy rights, is it fundamental or not? Is it anachronistic or not? And the argument that this is completely a misguided reading of the Constitution is in the dissent. But you can see how like, these rights are so key, how they get um, decided, whether they're fundamental or not. So that means that now we are having this debate in the states. So the Supreme Court may set out the grammar. The Supreme Court may highlight certain <coughs> elements. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the Supreme Court solves the actual basic difficulty of what are these laws going to look like. We can't argue whether or not self-defense is a fundamental right. That's off the table. However, there's many other things that we can be talking about. Uh, and I'm going to go through this so that we have time to have more question and answer at the end. Um, so um, last year, after the Parkland shooting, here are students in Montpelier saying 
got to stop this. No more guns. I don't feel safe going to school. And uh, it's persuasive to the Vermont legislature and to our Republican governor. Um, so after the Scott signs four bills, a lot of people are super angry. Here's my orange. The orange is for the gun rights. And then usually the um, gun safety people, they wear purple. So I'm trying to bring these colors both in. <laughs> you can see though, like, see you in court, Phil. Yeah. Right? Um, we've had enough of guns. And then another one, uh, you promised, hoping for more concern for them. However, um, despite what, I mean, this was an amazing moment. A Republican governor in the state of Vermont passes, signs four bills into law. One bill requires background checks. Second bill prohibits sale to persons under 21. Third bill bans large capacity ammunition feeding devices. And the fourth bill bans possession of bump fire stocks, which is what they used in Nevada. Um, so that is monumental in the sense of Vermont hasn't done this before. So we have a lot more restrictions. And they are not in opposition to Heller or McDon McDonald is the one that would really um, guide this. Because they're not saying you can't have guns not taking away anybody's fundamental right to self-defense. It's a way of chipping away, right? Or maybe if you were an opponent of these bills, you'd say, you're chipping away at my constitutional liberties. The bill that's up um, in front of the legislature now is being framed much more in terms of suicide prevention. And this is where the Heller um, piece about mental illness is important. This is from, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. Does anybody know this? <laughs> Clay? Clay? Lasher Sumner's executive director of Gun Sense Vermont. Um, somebody want to read um, this? This is why they're asking for a waiting period bill. Passing a waiting period bill allows the idea of silence and suicide to be not so prevalent. I don't, yeah. Can you just, keep, just by a state saying we have a problem, and this is a bill that will address that problem, is a very powerful. So I, I know this is sort of a, a rough little quote. I got it out of um, Vermont Digger. I, I mean, if we were to look at it, we need a waiting period bill in Vermont because people who are very, very depressed, feeling suicidal, if they don't, if, no, no, if nothing can stop them, they can quick get a gun. We need to do this. And the way, um, the way this bill is understood by Gun Sense Vermont is it's not that we're talking about gun control. It's that we're expressing how concerned we are about the high level of suicides, which is reasonable. It's, it's a different way of framing it. And it's much more of a public health issue than is a constitutional issue. They have a very good reason to be concerned. Um, maybe you all have been following this study by um, Case and Deaton of um, mortality of deaths of despair. In the United States, we appear to have an epidemic. This, they have many different graphs. And this one is uh, comparing us with France, Germany, all the places that Machiavelli would have said, oh, <laughs> you got to keep your citizens armed. Sweden, United Kingdom is going up a little bit. But look, I mean, isn't that fascinating? It begins in the 90s. Germany spikes and then goes down. France going down. The United Kingdom is slowly going up. Canada is going a little bit up. I don't know what that one on the bottom is. Is it Australia? Australia. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, whoa, look at the United States. What? Yeah, men and women ages 50 to 54. And when we think about Vermont's aging population, um, it's pretty bleak. So high access to guns, there's a good reason to think maybe a waiting period will help. 
Um, and that's, so that's how that's gotten framed. So, but what's the response from the other side? Because it's very hard to talk. First of all, I mean, suicide is a hard thing to talk about. Self-inflicted gun violence. What do you do about the self-defense issue? I mean, if, if there's a fundamental right to self-defense, is there also a fundamental right to self-annihilation? You know, there's, people could make that argument. Um, I mean, that's how it is when you're thinking about things legally or through rights or through the Constitution. We start to like, raise these questions. This is a tragedy. There's no other way to describe it. Or if you link it to abortion, are there privacy issues? If you, if you have a, a right to abort a fetus, you have a right to abort yourself. Right. Yeah. Did everyone hear, Scott, that here, if we think about this in terms of the abortion issue, there's a right to privacy, a right to do with your body what you feel right, is right for you to make that choice, pro-choice? Um, yeah, you could make this argument of, well, is it really a problem or not? Or are people um, doing, um, acting independently of their own free will? The age is, the age is interesting because it's not young people, right. drugs, alcohol, and suicide, life. and it's not the elderly who might want to end their life or something like that. It's like the age yeah. is very is interesting. Yes, and Why it's Pat. Yeah, Pat is saying the age is so interesting. It's not young people, it's not the very old. Yeah, Steve. Why is this study only that narrow age? <coughs> this is one chart I pulled out. So Case and Deaton have they've um, done a whole lot of investigations into these deaths by despair. Um, this is one that really popped up at them, that this age group seemed particularly susceptible. But they you can if you go and look uh, it's economic studies at Brookings, yeah. But it also doesn't just, these aren't just gun deaths, it's right. drugs, alcohol. We don't know how many of this is people shooting themselves. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And then what do you count suicide? Sometimes with drugs and alcohol, is it, was it suicide or was it accident? You could jump out of it. Exactly, yeah. So it doesn't, in no way elucidates yeah. suicide by gun. Right. The piece, yeah, Cambria. So there's a, been a study in the farming communities in the Midwest, and there's a large number. It's the, it's the highest cause of death for white males yeah. between like 45 and 60 because they're losing their farms, and they don't go out and you know, yeah. run themselves over or anything now, and they're getting despair. Mm -hmm. They're seeing um, a loss of jobs, of retraining. They're frightened about getting into the technical um, aspects and, and being retrained in tech. And they're just seeing that there's it's despair and they're just saying, that's it, I'm going to commit suicide. So I, I, I can't compete. I don't want to change. I like my life as it is. And right. so I'm they're committing suicide. Right. It's like the, high, the number one cause of death of white middle-aged farmers. Yeah. And, and I brought this one in. I'm, I'm glad that Cambria, did people hear what Cambria was talking about, how farmers in the Midwest and this very, very high rate of suicide and, and just a sense of despair. Um, there is um, other statistics I could bring out that show around gun violence and suicide. Uh, so gun violence is oftentimes now being characterized more as a public health issue because the suicide level through gun violence is so high. It's the most effective means. And it's not just men anymore. It used to be only men who shot themselves in the head. Now women are doing it as well, and young people. And we have certainly, I mean, this is close, right? We've just had major gun violence uh, around here. Three young people died. Um, and then uh, what's the story around that? So I'm not saying those were deaths by despair, but I really caught by this term of the level of despair and how gun violence fits into it. It is certainly the uh, approach that the Department of Mental Health in the state of Vermont is using. Uh, so this is a recent, I think, March 2019 panel of people from the state of Vermont wanting the waiting period bill in order to reduce suicide. How long is the waiting period? It was initially going to be 48 hours, but in committee it was dropped to 24 hours, and it was then reduced to just handguns. So this effort was like reduced. Yeah, Sheldon. Just think of what it would have been for Colorado if they'd had a waiting period last week. 
And, and Sheldon, can you remind us of, of what Sheldon is saying? What, like, if they. To Colorado and was able to purchase the shotgun immediately, and that caused the shutdown of 500,000 students in schools, mm -hmm. and she eventually committed suicide. Mm -hmm. that day. Mm -hmm. So, did people hear Sheldon about the case in, in Colorado? Um, that uh, if there had been a waiting period, perhaps that would not have happened. And, and these are, I mean, very strong arguments. If, we, if you can just stop it in that moment, uh, what did I hear that if um, school shooters that didn't actually follow through on their plans, there was usually some person who was nice to them on their way to commit mayhem, and it stopped them. So th there's this idea, right? There's this hot, hot moment. If you can somehow disrupt this hot, hot moment, that the violence will be diminished. Yeah, Sarah. I just want to make a point about the, the suicide in the farming community that uh, recently, I think it's the Department of Ag, when they communicate with farmers about their foreclosures or whatever, they also include a suicide prevention number. Wow. Yeah, and that has gone out in the farming community in Vermont. And so, you know, it's not just, you know, this potential isn't isolated to the yeah. it's it's national. Right. So, so Sarah's talking about how now when the Department of Ag in the state of Vermont is sending out a notice of foreclosure, there is included information about suicide prevention. So people are very much making this, tying this together. Clearly a problem. I found an interesting op-ed in Vermont Digger in response to this um, from Bill Agnew. I don't know who Bill Agnew is, but um, he wrote a really, from my perspective, talk about good clash, a way of looking at this problem and raising some issues that are debatable. One of my ongoing frustrations is the lack of recognition by many advocates that legitimate constitutional concerns are at play, both on our state and at the national level. So if we use a purely public health approach, we are missing out on a chance to talk about these constitutional issues. And I like to hear that because if we don't take our liberties at all seriously, and everything becomes about pathology or public health or public health prevention, or sorry, um, suicide prevention, then this other element gets written out. And I think it's worth talking about. So I, I appreciated Scott saying, well, what about the right to privacy? If we're gonna be part of this experiment, which has a high degree of liberties, we should at least be able to talk about that. And so he's concerned that when people make a public health argument, they don't also talk about the constitutional reasons. So perhaps if you were wanting to argue for a waiting period, you would want to make a constitutional argument as well as a public health argument and not give up on the Constitution. So that's, that'll make a good clash. And then this one also dropped out at me. And it, because in our discussion of the abortion debate, um, I think somebody last week said, well, if women can be in charge, then women will make the decision because it, it affects women, and so women should be the, the deciders. So not surprisingly, here's somebody asking, if you don't own a firearm, can you really be making this call? <laughs> Who gets to decide? If women get to decide about abortion rights, Shouldn't gun owners get to decide about gun rights? And this is the other one. Somebody want to read this? <coughs> it's hard for me to envision how a non-representative panel imposing its ideas on an at-risk population represents a meaningful solution. Yeah. So, and this is something, again, if we're going to have good clash, we want people being able to talk to each other who actually have are speaking from their own experience, who, are, who look a little bit like the people they're wanting, whose behavior they want to change. And right now, you can tell the aesthetic, right? The, the polarized, besides the colors, there's a very different aesthetic on the part of the people wanting gun safety in Vermont and the people who are wanting gun rights in Vermont. And that aesthetic is like, you know, they, they talk about Starbucks versus Dunkin' Donuts. This aesthetic is even further apart, right? 
Yeah, Cambria, and then. Couldn't, couldn't the same thing be said for if you've lost a loved one to gun violence? Mm -hmm. Aren't you the one who should make the decision? So that's the other side of that. So, and the time, did everybody hear Cambria's question? If, if you've lost somebody to gun violence, shouldn't you be part of the decision makers? Uh, for those of you who are at the Putney Library when we talked about the Second Amendment, and um, a lot of uh, gun owners of Vermont came to that, I almost wonder if, did I intentionally forget which I was supposed to do when? I, I, I don't want to think of it as a Freudian slip, but normally when I give a talk on guns, I have a lot of people who um, are from gun owners of Vermont. And they, so they may show up next week wondering what, what, ha what happened, and we'll be talking about capital punishment. But I, I'd love to get their ideas, because we're going to do that same experiment of what are the arguments for, what are the arguments against, make plausible arguments. Um, when we did this in Putney, there was many conversations about people whose lives were saved because they had a gun, and people who were killed because they didn't have a gun. Ah! And then, so that, and that's when it, the stories got really, really interesting. I don't know if anybody wants to, who was there wants to mention that discussion. Oh, we got, yeah, Julie, did you? I wasn't there, but I just, I think it's really important to uh, understand that many gun owners are concerned with gun control. Mm -hmm. Gun safety. I'm yeah. speaking about my husband actually, mm -hmm. and I, he was really disappointed when you changed that. Oh no! He was going to come next week. But anyway, <clears throat> um, he's very anti NRA. Uh -huh. So it's not it's not such a polarized. I mean, there are people on the side. That you may think that all gun owners are, you know, like those guys in the picture there. Uh -huh. But that that isn't true because there are many, many responsible gun owners, right. especially in yeah. this state. Right. Yeah. Because of the hunting culture, for example. Right. Right. And, and so there's going to be, Julie, Julie's talking about her husband who may be a gun, who is a gun owner, but is for gun safety, is for gun control, is for regulation and that sort of thing. And, and to be able to share those stories feels really, really important. Uh, Shoshana. Um, a, a, a part of this who gets to decide thing, oh. uh, for me, it has always been we, we only talk about citizens, uh, non-militarized, non-police force citizens, you know, what, what their rights are with guns. I think it should be included are the police mm -hmm. that uh, that for me I've seen the the Second Amendment in part as a or at least in its original conception as a protection against the state having sort of outgunning the individual and therefore having more power mm -hmm. over individuals and being misused in many ways as as we see happens nowadays with police forces are so heavily armed, the, the arms that they carry, the kinds of weapons they have, are way beyond anything mm -hmm. that individuals have. Uh, I mean, you know, they've got army stuff. The army gives them mm -hmm. stuff. So the idea of citizens not having any arms and having these police forces mm -hmm. heavily, heavily armed and, and misusing that power in many instances, um, that, that just has to come into the discussion mm -hmm. from my point of view. Right. So that, you know, so if you're going to, so to talk about restrictions, and I'm not, you know, I'm not against restrictions, but I want them to apply to everybody, including the police forces. Mm -hmm. Right, so did people hear Shoshana in terms of if the police is heavily militarized, I mean, why did the Black Panthers need to carry AR-15s, AK-47s? It's because the LAPD was, was basically a, created a war against them. And, and so it was at that level of, of there was no way you were going to get anywhere if you were a black person organizing unless you had an armed contingent. I mean, I, that seems like a crazy things to say, but no, that's kind of the reality. And I think that's, honestly, I think that's what Machiavelli is getting at. If you, if really going to want the, the if you're going to want um, 
to have, you can't disarm people if you're going to be a tyrant. You can't disarm people. If maybe, you know, Australia, I know, they're wanting to disarm and they're probably going to be fairly functional at doing that. I want to believe that. But, or New Zealand, is that, right, sorry, New Zealand, sorry. Um, yeah, there was one other hand up, Julie. I'm sorry, not Julie, I always do that, Edie. Edie. That's true. Why don't the police say, when they see something and they're not sure, why don't they say, who are you? What are you doing here? Instead of just shooting them. Yeah. Why don't they just talk to them? Yeah, Edie asked, why don't, you, why don't the police just talk? Did you know that some of the de-escalation protocols were um, removed? Oh, really? Yeah, so they, there were more de-escalation protocols amongst the police and they were removed, I was it 10, 12 years ago? So some of this may be part of the militarization of the police, people coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan, looking for jobs. They are used to operating in a more military uh, situation. They think Fallujah, they can get confused between, wow, is it Keene or is it Fallujah? And, um, and then uh, some of this de-escalation training has been taken out. Now, that means it could be put back in. But there, we're having a situation where the whole piece about guns and who has like uh, use of force, legitimate use of force, if it's just the police, hmm, that's a problem. So um, Janice, and then I'm just going to. I just wanted to refer up. back to your uh, question about the, um, the Putney discussion um, with the representatives of the gun activists, I guess I call them. Um, I was impressed with how incredibly knowledgeable they are about the Constitution and the history of what they see as their rights, uh, which put me, certainly, and most of us to shame. Um, you did a fabulous job of, of uh, managing that discussion, I think. Um, but another um, experiment like that that some people who live in Putney might be aware of is we had a, a rally on the Common, mm -hmm. which is private property in the summer, I guess, after the bill was signed. And um, there were you know, a lot of supporters of um, Gun Sense Vermont there. And there was a small group that came in with these signs of, of gun activists. And um, you know, it could have really disintegrated into a clash. And Laura Chapman invited them to come and speak. Mm -hmm. And um, I did. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, many people um, surrounded them and started an exchange of views, including some of very you know opinionated people in Putney. It was a great <laughs> example of good clash thanks to Laura's managing. Bad story. Did she, Janice is talking about an event in Putney of of where Gun Sense Vermont was right next to gun owners of Vermont. It could have been a bad clash. It could have looked like we're not listening to them. Laura Chapman went over and asked some questions and then invited people to speak. I mean, if you give people a chance to speak, then it's going to move into good clash. You used it yes. now, and it opened up yeah. opportunities for people yeah. to talk to each other. Exactly, yeah. So key. I think we're just about out of time. Um, I had a few final questions. Um, oh. And I don't think we're going to be able to do this well, so we're going to go for next time. So next time, just to, to let you know, I'll be asking for, again, that same thing we did with the abortion debate. What were the arguments you found most compelling? Uh, what type on the opponent's side did you find most compelling? And then what was the least plausible? So we'll, we'll have a chance for that. So that's what we're going to do when we start next time. My game plan, if you all are up for this, is that for the very final class, we're going to revisit some of these debates and do a little forum theater which will be role play, where we'll take different sides and imagine what could that be like. Um, it, depending on, I may also invite some Marlboro College students who are always game to play this kind of a thing, willing to do role plays, but I could imagine other people wanting to jump in from the audience. So that we get to practice this very thing that Janice just talked about, being in the same room with people who you strongly disagree with, being curious about their arguments enough, so that you can actually take them in and, and weigh and consider them, give them some suggestions on what might be more convincing to me, in case you want to try and persuade me, uh, rather than just 
holding our heads, our hands on our ears. It's the old debate club model. It's the old debate club model. It's the sign which side you would take. Yes. You couldn't choose your side. Yeah. How many people here had debate club? Yes. Yes. We, don't, but we need to have more debates. Yeah. Um, we do have time for just a couple questions or any other thoughts, comments, questions in the back. Yes. I, I, uh, I recall uh, a couple from Vermont who had just had their son take his own life being adamantly uh, propelling the, the idea that they, they don't want another child in the state to, uh, to die that way. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence that suicide is very impulsive and that if you get through that two or three day period where people are most despondent, they oftentimes you know, turn it around. There are some people who really try hard to take their own life and survive are very happy eventually if they do survive, but they do take their own life. So I was just wondering, for those people who are adamantly for guns rights, how those people see this argument, and how we can, you know, agree to, to there, there, there are good things about both sides. It right, seems to me right. That's, yeah. Um, at the uh, Bob's question about uh, if suicide, we know that if somebody can be, there can be an intervention during that really, really desperate moment. Many people who don't take their lives are grateful that they didn't die in that moment. So how can we get this sort of idea out that this could be useful? Um, this to me feels like the key piece of how can this group be much more representative of the people that they're trying to help. Right now, it doesn't look like a representative group of the people who are dying deaths of despair. Uh, and, and that may be something as we go forward with this question, um, because I know when I brought that up in Putney with the sex, Second Amendment discussion, um, and I said, well, what about the fact that it's a high amount of suicide? That felt like a really forbidden topic. I don't, I don't know if other people remember that. It was one thing to talk about gun rights. And it was another thing to talk about constitutional rationale. But then to expose a group and to say you are risk prone to suicide did not go down well. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mean to do it that way. But in I'm saying, well, what do you do about the statistics where so much gun violence is self-inflicted? That was a shutdown. So that's going to be an interesting piece. Anyway, so Steve, and then we're going to stop. Yep. I'm just. Uh, thinking back to your quote from Spinoza and thinking that um, not acknowledging the um, emotional underpinnings of any of these arguments um, skips over a step so that uh, we end up arguing about um, constitutional rights without noticing that the reason that we're the reason that we're so energized about Second Amendment now has to do with enormous failures in our society that affect people psychologically, that make it so that people are so angry with each other, um, and that maybe without speaking on that psychological level, there's no way to make progress on the constitutional level. That is a great way to end. Yes, we need to hold on to the emotional level. Thank you, everybody.